Okay, Johns, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage, and welcome to our virtual history series, a partnership with us and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation, um, or maybe welcome back if you have uh, joined us. I think we're on uh, episode, if that's the right term, uh, episode number 12. Um, and before introducing our speakers today, um, I just want to say uh, first another thank you to everybody for, for taking half an hour out and joining us. Um, and thank you to those of you who have voluntarily donated. Your uh, donations and whatever amounts are uh, very, very much appreciated. So thank you. Um, and then one final sort of uh, pre-event announcement is next week, uh, which I think if I'm doing the math right, is July 31st, um, we've got the captain of the Pride of Baltimore, Captain Miles, is going to join us. And uh, I think we're all going to learn about clipper ships uh, in high seas and uh, what the Pride of Baltimore has done in the past and what it's, uh, what it's doing now. So come back, uh, come back in a week if you can make it. All right, so today uh, we're gonna talk about Druid Hill Park uh, and transportation and access. Uh, and I'm really, really pleased uh, we have not one speaker, but two, and I think that's actually maybe a milestone for this virtual history series. Um, uh, Graham Carrillo Allen uh, is joining us. He is a public artist uh, and an advocate for the neighborhoods around Druid Hill Park. Um, he's also an Open Society Institute fellow uh, doing work uh, over the next year or so um, on uh, access, better access to Druid Hill Park. So Graham, thank you. Oh, oh, and his, he is a Baltimore Heritage Board member. So uh, uh, especially proud of that one, I'm sure. Um, and then Jennifer Kunze is joining us. Um, she is the Pro Maryland Program Manager for Clean Water Action. Um, and she's been at that for four years, uh, working on uh, public health issues and transportation issues uh, here in Baltimore and in Maryland. And I think Graham, uh, you're going first. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and, uh, and go ahead. Oh, share your screen. Um, one final comment. Uh, if you, we're gonna take questions at the end. So if you have a question at any time during the talks, uh, type it in the chat box, the Zoom chat box, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. All right, thanks so much. All right, uh, well, thanks, Johns. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Graham Carell Allen and I'm a public artist. I've been uh, privileged enough to be working with my neighbors around Druid Hill Park on the access project for Druid Hill Park, reconnecting residents with Druid Hill Park through participatory planning and public art. This was uh, my OSI 2018 fellowship focus. Um, so here's Ockentrally Terrace. I live on the 3200 block, which is sort of in the foreground there. And there's a bunch of neighbors and I, um, along with our councilmen and a city folks going on a, uh, a code walk. Um, I uh, create public art for pedestrian safety and play. And I also lead interactive walking tours that mix poetry with sort of political geography and uh, elevating the voices of residents as public space is ultimately created by the people who occupy it and shape it through their everyday actions. If you've been to Artscape or other things, you may have seen my work uh, on the streets. Um, my neighborhood, uh, technically known as Parkview slash Woodbrook, but no one calls it that. We call it Ockentrally Terrace or simply Mondawmin, uh, is reflective of like a lot of Baltimore neighborhoods. It's a predominantly African-American uh, working income and uh, you know um, higher density uh, row houses and also um, <clears throat> a, a minority of people drive alone. So I wanna point out the graph on the lower right-hand corner. Most of our residents walk, take the subway, you know, they do ride sharing, bicycle, and uh, especially take the bus. Um, so uh, this is what Druid Park Lake Drive and Ockentrala Terrace, the two big arterial streets that frame Druid Hill Park on the south and west sides are, uh, you know, how they've developed over time. Uh, this was the original Ockentrala Estate, which later became uh, renamed Druid Hill uh, and then became Druid Hill Park when it was purchased by the city in 1860. Uh, here we have it in 1872 with Reservoir Hill and Mandaman areas uh, kind of being developed. 1893, you can see that the street grid is mostly finished here. Um, and, uh, and here we've got it totally finished by 1900. This is also around the time that they first started letting cars into the park. Uh, and by that, it was actually a bus um, that people paid a small fare to enjoy this exceptional experience of riding on a motor vehicle, motor coach. Um, and here it is in 1927, uh, in an aerial picture. And you can kind of see what it was like before all the highways. Um, so I'll zoom in on that later, but here we are 1938. I just want to point out on the right hand side, you can see the uh, 29th Street Bridge is now constructed. That was a 
sort of depression uh, era jobs program. Uh, fast forwarding to 1953 on the west side of the park, you can see all of a sudden what was then known as the Druid Hill Expressway widened Ockentrolley Terrace from a two lane residential street into a roaring five to nine lane wide highway. This effectively cut off uh, residents from being able to walk to the park with the exception of a few uh, cross streets. And here we are in 1972. And if you kind of look onto the right, you can see all of a sudden the east side of the park is cut off by the Jones Falls Expressway and a big spaghetti, a big pile of spaghetti mess uh, over there at 28th and 29th Street bridges. Um, and here we have it today. So just to zoom back in, once again, this is what it used to look like here in my neighborhood. Every single side street was, uh, had a set of paths, you know, a crosswalk and a set of paths that went into the park, curvy, linear, beautiful footpaths, bridal paths, and so forth. So no matter where you lived, you had easy and convenient access. You walked across two lanes of uh, most <laughs> horse-drawn carriage traffic and people walking to get into the park. And you can see by between the construction of the Drood Hill Expressway and the Jones Falls Expressway, uh, between the 1940s and the 1960s, we lost 16 of our historical park access points. And so all the uh, sort of pink circles, those were former uh, places that you could walk across the street and be in Druid Hill Park that no longer exist. Now we have uh, about eight formal crossings uh, into the park. Those are places where you have a crosswalk where you know, you're sort of legally empowered to uh, take your life into your own hands and uh, experience these conditions. So this is the 29th Street Bridge. Uh, this is before the big jump, but you can see it's a very narrow sidewalk. It's not ADA compliant. Two people in wheelchairs would not be able to safely pass each other on this sidewalk. Uh, this is the pedestrian bridge that was constructed in the early 1960s for the Jones Falls Expressway. And um, it is also not ADA compliant. It's got a big ledge there. The other side, it's got steps. Um, this is the crosswalk at Linden uh, from Reservoir Hill into the park. Um, and this is, the, uh, this is the button that does not instill much confidence whatsoever that if you beg and you press that button, maybe the cars will stop, I don't know. Uh, and then here you can see where the cars definitely did not stop. They jumped the curb several times and continued to bash out tons, literally tons of stone, historic, beautiful granite stones uh, that now kind of uh, were strewn about the sidewalk because of these errant uh, motorists. Um, we did get some decorative lamp posts. That was a nice gesture, I suppose, uh, but the motorists uh, still um, don't seem to understand, you know, where to honor the folks that rely on walking and how we get into the park. Uh, this is a historic path that has not been maintained. Um, so you can see it's also not ADA compliant. Really cool old asphalt hexagonal pavers, but um, unfortunately not really great for most folks. Uh, this is what it looks like if you're a kid playing basketball over at Cloverdale Basketball Courts at the uh, southwest corner of the park. This is the type of traffic that you face should you want to go to the playground in the park. Um, this is where they put in curb ramps, uh, but no crosswalk. Uh, this is what's supposed to be a crosswalk, mostly chipped away. Um, once again, uh, this is at Fulton and Druid Hill Avenue, uh, crosswalk mostly gone. And this is at Gwynn's Falls Parkway, where the crosswalk was also mostly gone. These are some of the conditions that we've been living with for the most part over the past five years. Very degraded entrances. Um, Motorists not really, uh, you know, taking many any cues whatsoever to yield to pedestrians, and uh, these are some of the, you know, scenes. These are some of the scenes that I, I witnessed when <clears throat> cruising around my neighborhood on foot and bicycle. Uh, these are kids who are coming from the playground and they're crossing ten lanes of traffic, dodging cars in order to get back to uh, Penn North. This is eight lanes of traffic. This is in front of where I live. 143 crossing distance, no crosswalks. You can see people kind of far off in the distance, sort of stuck in the median, waiting for cars to pass. And this is often what it's like where we have families, moms with strollers, little kids on bicycles who are coming from the side streets where there used to be crosswalks, uh, but those no longer exist. And they have to wait for the, you know, uh, and pray that they can make it across uh, without encountering any of the vehicles that are driving at extreme speeds. And this is what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to things like the Druid Hill Farmers Market that takes place on Wednesday afternoons. Very popular market, but a lot of folks actually have to carpool, believe it or not, just to go a couple of blocks in order to safely get to the farmer's market, something that otherwise, you know, should be, we should be able to walk too easily. Um, you know, using the pavilions in Druid Hill Park, this is one of our block parties from a few years ago. And um, so obviously this has been a concern. Uh, when I moved to the neighborhood from Waverly in uh, 2013, I first heard about some of the uh, attempts that folks made, uh, but it really wasn't uh, until 2017 uh, when the councilman Leon Pinkett and Bike More and People for Bikes were able to secure a grant with DOT to help create a pedestrian 
uh, and bicycle and wheelchair pathway known as the Big Jump. And so this essentially converted one of the travel lanes along Drew Park Lake Drive and for the first time ever essentially made it possible for people to effectively cross the Jones Falls Expressway in a protected manner if you were not in a car. So that's that's a pretty big uh, that's a pretty big uh, improvement. You know, it's not perfect, but this is kind of what you can do with relatively low amounts of money uh, without actually changing the street infrastructure. Um, and it's proved very successful. Uh, we had a kickoff. We did walks and tours where we heard from residents that rely on the big jump. You know, such as Miss D, who uses a motorized uh, wheelchair. Other folks walking and riding their bikes to and from work. Um, and uh, this kind of fed into a coalition that we've uh, developed to advocate for continued improvements around the park, uh, which led to DOT agreeing to conduct a major transportation study, which is technically known as the Druid Park Lake Drive Complete Streets Design Effort. Uh, this includes not only Druid Park Lake Drive, but it also look at uh, redesigning Ocantrali Terrace as well as parts of Green Spring and Druid Park Drive up at the top of the park to really ensure that all entrances to the park serve the needs of all people and balance out how we all uh, get around. In the meantime, we've been doing a lot of advocacy, you know, pushing to restripe crosswalks, threatening to go to the media until DOT would do that. Um, uh, unfortunately, I did witness a person who was in a motorized wheelchair that was trying to use a crosswalk that was all but non-existent. They were struck by a bus. I saw them getting loaded up into an ambulance. And I used this uh, example, uh, you know, sad example as a uh, a motivator to help uh, get DOT and Reckon Parks to start restriping, just real basic stuff. You know, even this stuff, it's it's like an okay start, but it's we really need a lot more. Um, so uh, we've been doing walks and listening to neighbors and you know hearing about the histories uh, of, of people organizing in the neighborhood, the history of Akintrali Terrace and Mandaman, and um, uh, as well as talking more specifically about, you know, how is it that we could we could more easily walk around this area, getting to places like the mall and the metro station. Once again, hearing from our neighbors and using this uh, to understand, you know, what is it that uh, the Drew Park Lake Drive Complete Streets Design Effort should represent. I also got to collaborate with a couple of amazing artists and moms, uh, Courtney Bettle and Jesse DeSantis down in Reservoir Hill. Jesse had created this beautiful painting of. Uh, the Druid Hill Gate, and we used that as inspiration for a lighting project last year during uh, the Light City Neighborhood Lights uh, component. We also had a huge parade, and so, I mean, believe it or not, for uh, a good solid 15 minutes, we shut down traffic on Drew Park Lake Drive while the marching band crossed, and we all celebrated and continued our march through the park along an illuminated path all the way to the conservatory. Uh, where we had a big uh, family-friendly dance party. And these are the kinds of programming that we really want to push and make more available by improving access to Druid Hill Park. So um, DOT was an originally supposed to start their public component of the study at the beginning of 2019. Obviously, that hasn't happened yet, and here we are in the middle of 2020. Uh, they have selected a firm to lead the study, uh, and this is a big deal. It's a big firm, WSP, with a lot of partners, and they're going to be doing not only um, a... Uh, uh, kind of the, the conceptual design, but also a significant amount of engineering. And that's going to enable this uh, plan to effectively go straight into the capital improvement uh, process. In other words, uh, have a pathway for getting it funded sooner rather than lady, later through the city. Um, so we're looking, uh, we're eagerly awaiting uh, them to start their study, uh, hopefully here uh, coming up soon, late summer, early fall. We're expecting opportunities to provide public input. But in the meantime, we've taken all the information that we collected from our art gatherings and our neighborhood walks, and we've compiled it into this report to represent especially the needs of folks living on the west side of the park. And this sort of complements some other reports that were already developed for Reservoir Hill over the years. And we're really excited to leverage these as starting points for the conversation with DOT and their contractors when we do actually get started. So thank you all very much. If you want to learn more, uh, I'm always happy to chat. Um, best way to reach me is email. My email is graham at grahamprojects.com. Grahamprojects.com is also where you can see my artwork. And if you want to follow Tap Druid Hill and our efforts, uh, there you are on social media at Tap Druid Hill, basically everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. Um, while, uh, while we switch over to Jennifer, um, just a reminder, if you have questions, uh, start typing away and for, for Graham and for Jennifer, and then we'll get to them uh, at the end. Jennifer, do you want to share your screen? 
mute and let's make sure you're unmuted. All right. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So um, my name is Jennifer. And um, like John said, I'm the Maryland Program Manager at Clean Water Action. And we're a national environmental organization that um, does a lot of work on environmental issues that impact public health. I'm really lucky to um, be in a role where I'm focusing on city and county level policies across the state of Maryland looking at that. And one of the biggest things that impacts public health in Baltimore is the transportation sector and the way that we've prioritized cars as a city um, for a very long time. And Graham really illustrated that powerfully with all those historical pictures um, of the areas around Druid Hill Park and how they changed over time. And um, that was the story of the whole city for the past century. You can see in this picture from 1911 that the city grid at one time had no 83, no MLK Boulevard, no 395. Pratt and Lombard didn't function as these big commuter pathways through the city, but were just streets um, that you had all kinds of traffic on. And so how on earth did people get around without all of this infrastructure to support private car use? Streetcars. Um, Baltimore once had this really robust streetcar system and in the 1920s it had over 400 miles of lines crisscrossing the city and you could get virtually anywhere in the city within a half hour trip. My grandmother lived in Old Goucher growing up and she always used to talk about taking the streetcar up Greenmount Avenue to um, Eastern High School on 33rd Street. And her parents worked down at Bethlehem Steel and they could also take the streetcar all the way to work there which is almost impossible without a car now. But Baltimore was once the city where living without a car was easy when everybody had to do it. Um, but what changed? In 1948, our streetcar system was bought by National City Lines, which was a business controlled by General Motors, which was working to monopolize the transportation market at the time. And so National City Lines started converting the system over to buses. And as they were doing that, transit ridership in Baltimore fell by double digits every year following. Um, and around the same time, folks who are familiar with the history of federal housing policy know that this was the time period when um, uh, fe federal policies and urban planning were supporting um, mainly white families like mine to move out to the suburbs through financial incentives and, and through the way that we were planning our road network. And um, that helped build wealth for these white families moving out to the suburbs, but really, really hurt the black neighborhoods that um, were still in the city. And, um, around that time, there were highways planned to cut all throughout Baltimore, through Federal Hill, Fells Point, around the Inner Harbor, like you see right here, cutting through Federal Hill. Um, but due to steadfast community opposition and the work of the movement against destruction, most of those plans were scrapped. They were never built. Um, but the areas that were built were mainly ones that um, helped solve other problems that people had. So you had 83 cover over most of the Jones Falls, which was incredibly polluted and smelly and was really an environmental hazard. Um, but much worse, the only portion of I-70, which was planned to cut all the way across the city through Mount Vernon, that was actually constructed, um, the highway to nowhere in West Baltimore, destroyed a Black neighborhood that's still dealing with um, the repercussions of those planning decisions today. And the portions of the Baltimore Beltway that cut through and closest to the city go through the industrial areas in South and East Baltimore that were already overburdened with pollution. And so now today, as a result of all of that car-centric planning and prioritizing private cars, um, not only is it hard to get to our green spaces by walking through our neighborhoods in the city, but we have these high, um, high speed highways and um, main streets through neighborhoods acting as these high throughput commuter roadways. And meanwhile, over 30% of people in Baltimore City have no access to a private vehicle. And this is a really big equity issue that we need to solve. But it also has a big impact on public health. Um, usually when we think about air pollution, we're thinking about smokestacks, really visible, um, obvious sources, like, for example, Bresco on Russell Street um, or the coal plants outside of the city. This is a picture I took years ago on a visit to the CP Crane coal plant um, a couple miles east of the city. 
And thanks to the work of a lot of organizations and activists across the state, we're seeing these point source polluters either clean up their act or shut down, which is really exciting. Um, but that's not enough to clean up our air when um, the transportation sector is this enormous polluter that we continue to prioritize private cars in. And according to a 2016 report from the Maryland Department of the Environment, um, over a third of the total greenhouse gases produced in Maryland come from the transportation sector. And um, not only that, but the transportation sector contributes enormously to the local air pollutants that impact our health. Um, and they're not doing it at smokestacks high in the air, mostly outside of the city. They're doing it right in our neighborhoods in front of our homes. Um, a report by the American Public Transportation Association said that per every mile traveled by each passenger, um, if we switched one mile of one person in a car to one mile of somebody taking public transit, that public transit trip would only produce 5% of the carbon monoxide that cars do. Um, it would only produce 8% as much volatile organic compound pollution and it would produce less than 50% of the carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxides as, as that private car trip would. And nit nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds are a really big problem for local air pollution because when they're combined with heat, especially extreme heat like we've been having, they produce ozone and smog. Um, and ozone is a big problem in Baltimore City. We have an F from the Maryland Lung Association for the number of high ozone days that we have. And you can see that that's trending upward right now. And this is much worse in Baltimore City than elsewhere. Um, it, our rate of um, asthma hospitalizations, which is mainly contributed to uh, by this ozone air pollution, as well as um, other factors within people's homes and other sources of air pollution, um, more than half I mean, more than twice of the rate at the state, rest of the state of Maryland, and Maryland is even worse than the national average. And this is most strongly correlated with rates of poverty. So you've got the um, rate of hospital admissions for asthma on the left and the median household income on the right. And folks who are familiar with Baltimore will see that classic that black butterfly pattern where the predominantly black neighborhoods in East and West Baltimore have the most poverty and the most air pollution. In addition to um, the downtown core where you've got a lot of um, car travel concentrated with big um, tall buildings that trap air pollution and trap heat and contribute to that ozone formation. And um, both of those last two graphics came from a report from our friends at the Environmental Integrity Project that do a lot of really important legal and research work around environmental health issues in the state. And they found that um, the four of the five zip codes with the worst asthma problems um, had even smaller areas with extremely, extremely bad air pollution, um, predominantly in East and West Baltimore, these zip codes. And in those areas, about half of the um, uh, air pollution causing asthma was from roadway vehicle pollution. And that's more, more than twice as much as any other source. So the way we prioritized cars really, really hurts our, uh, everyone's pub health, but it especially hurts the health of people who are already dealing with um, uh, uh, low income, with um, the historic patterns of racism that we've seen in everything about planning in Baltimore, and this is just compounding these problems. Um, but if we are able to start moving away from private vehicle transportation in this way through projects like what Graham is doing, through bigger, through investing in public transit, through other initiatives, we can really start to change that. And we saw a really weird example of that just in these past couple months. I think everyone saw, um, oh, sorry, yeah, this is just to say that um, really these other problems and everything is connected. You've got kids missing school for asthma because of the way that um, in these past couple months, I think everybody saw these viral pictures on social media, saw smog and um, air pollution really clean up in cities across the country. And um, electricity was still being produced, coal plants were still burning, 
their coal, but um, you had vastly fewer people driving every day. And we really saw that play out in, here in Maryland and in our region when we had traffic on 95 decrease by half during that time period during the stay at home orders and the nitrogen dioxide pollution that contributes to smog and contributes to asthma was down by 30%. So if we make planning changes that can make um, these, these, uh, these really conditions that came about for a horrible situation, if we can find better ways to make these changes long-term and get fewer on the road, we'll really see a big public health benefit and especially a public health benefit that will be, um, I want to just extremely briefly away planning, but a public safety issue, which is that um, prioritizing road construction leading to all of this asphalt crisscrossing the city um, really creates a big problem when it rains because all of this rain that would soak into the ground has nowhere to go. And so we see severe flooding. This is from a couple of years ago um, under I-83. We see sinkholes open up when this water gets trapped underground. Um, we see roadways collapse. This is when the roadway on 26th Street collapsed onto the railway tracks a couple years ago. And so um, there aren't just these chronic um, problems with prioritizing car transport in the way that we've done in the past couple decades, but um, these really acute public health, public safety problems as well. Um, um, but by pro through projects like Grams, through um, investing in public transit, bringing back the Baltimore Red Line, and um, starting to right size the amount of attention that we put towards car infrastructure versus other healthier ways to get us ourselves around the city, um, we can really start to correct these inequitable trends that we've had over the past century and um, create transit options that are better for our health and for our city and um, for fighting climate change. So um, yeah, thanks so much for everybody for joining us. And I think we're, we probably have questions coming up next. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you, Jennifer. And, and thanks again, uh, Graham. Um, I'm looking at the chat box and my chat box does not have questions. So I'm gonna ask a question, uh, uh, what is it called? Priming the pump maybe. Um, and maybe this one's for you, Graham. Uh, your work with trying to improve access to Druid Hill Park um, is going on at the same time that we're get, we're, we're burying the drinking water supplies um, and changing the park pretty dramatically uh, in that regard. Is there is there coordination? Is that part of the uh, are, are the plan? Is the planning going on at the same time, or are those like two separate things totally? Uh, and they are trying to coordinate the best they can. Uh, right now, the uh, the reservoir project, which is a, a DPW-led effort to bury two massive tanks under the west end of uh, the historic reservoir um, to provide safe drinking water, that is, is going to require digging a, a big trench and putting a pipe underneath, uh, a seven-foot diameter pipe underneath Drew Park Lake Drive. So that will disrupt the big jump. Uh, it's also going to a result in repaving a lot of Druid Park Lake Drive. So there is a, I think an, uh, they are attempting, DOT and DPW are trying to coordinate so that uh, it, whatever work they do around that will um, lend itself to the anticipated uh, design of the future for Druid Park Lake Drive. Of course, we're not gonna have our design effort completed before DPW needs to dig that trench. So um, there's gonna be a, a little bit of sort of uh, you know, error there potentially. Um, but uh, we are actively working with the city to ensure that people will continue to have access, uh, be it a uh, wheelchair, bus, scooter, bicycle, walking across that uh, Jones Falls Expressway Bridge. That's really crucial to, to maintain that access for people who do not drive. So DOT has committed to providing some type of alternative path during the construction period. Excellent. All right, the, the priming worked. We're getting some questions here. Um, first one is, uh, I think for Graham, uh, do traffic counts even justify having roads that wide around the park? So there, uh, it hasn't been published yet, but I am in touch with a, a firm that was actually hired to conduct a study of the, the big jump pathway where the, you know, effectively took a two travel lanes and reduced it down to one heading east. And um, their traffic counts showed that 
uh, the, um, the impact of the, the, the big jump was actually minimal uh, in that car speeds did drop some, uh, but it did not uh, you know, create the types of major car backups that people expected. There was a little bit of car backups at first. DOT made some adjustments to light timing, and now it's going smoothly. Um, so the study itself will actually encompass a much bigger traffic count and a much bigger traffic analysis of all the arterial and you know side streets to kind of judge um, how you know the motorists uh, will probably be react uh, as as these roads are redesigned. And the idea isn't to you know get rid of cars altogether. It's just to slow them down and make them more like a neighborhood boulevard. You know something nice like what you have in New Orleans with uh, St. Charles Street you know, um, and uh, where every every single side street is a crossing point. And I think that we can balance that out. Excellent. All right, I've got one uh, here for you, Jennifer. Um, is there an active plan to bring back the red line? Yeah, a, a lot of people have been working on that ever since 2015. And I mean, it's really difficult because Governor Hogan's decision to the enormous federal contribution to that public, to that project was really devastating, and um, it it's a, this enormous project that we really needed those federal dollars for. But the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition has been working to um, get back on the, get, get some momentum back behind bringing the project back. And right now, actually, they're um, doing a ballot in it. Jennifer, I think you're fading out, at least for me. Give you one more second. All right, Jennifer, I'm sorry to say, I think uh, I think we, we lost you. Um, wherever you are, we lost you. Um, and then uh, we'll do one more question uh, for Graham, luckily, uh, whose audio seems to be working. And is it true that after the reservoir work is done, the lake can be used for recreation? Uh, yes and no. Um, so technically, yes, the lake will no longer be drinking water. And so that it, it will be continued to, uh, to be aerated. In other words, it'll stay, it will stay fresh and nice and won't have algae. Uh, and in a lot of the master planning, you know, there was a uh, local sentiment towards uh, creating opportunities for things like swimming and boating and so forth. Um, that will technically be possible. However, it is not funded. Uh, so right now, what is funded within DPW's scheme is to essentially restore the historic kind of lake path, add a few more sidewalks, add a platform for a stage, but not the band shell. The band shell is not funded, um, just the platform, some sort of outdoor uh, ledges that you could sit on to enjoy an outdoor amphitheater. Uh, but there is no dock. There is no boathouse. There's no cafe. There's no swimming area funded right now. So funding all that to realize the larger master plan as it was envisioned many years ago, in, in part thanks to the facilitation of Baltimore Heritage, uh, will require probably some type of public-private partnership that there is. Uh, uh, there are several people working on right now in West Baltimore trying to kind of figure out a model to, to make that happen around Druid Hill Park. Excellent. Uh, all right, Jennifer, we're going to give you one more stab at finishing your answer, and then uh, and then we're going to bid everybody a, a happy Friday. Are you, are you with us, Jennifer? Yeah, I think so. Um, okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I'm not sure how much you heard, so I'll be um, brief, but um, it the 2015 de decision from Governor Hogan was really devastating, and it will be hard to bring, it will be difficult to bring back the red line without the massive federal investment that he just left on the table. But the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition is working right now on a ballot initiative that would create a regional transportation authority, uh, move towards creating a regional transportation authority with the ability to raise funds um, and do transportation planning on its own instead of relying on the state, um, which is the situation we're in right now. So that's that would be an enormous step towards um, being able to bring back the red line and also have more local control over our transportation system. And I see somebody's already on top of me and um, put the link to that ballot initiative in the chat box. So I really encourage everyone to go um, sign that electronically so that the city can have a choice about whether to create this um, 
move towards creating a transportation authority on, on the ballot in November. Excellent. All right, you, uh, you came through crystal clear at the end there, Jennifer, so thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I'll, uh, I'll pause for a second uh, to give everybody a chance before pulling the plug uh, to, to click on that link if you wanna be part of the petition. And if you haven't checked the chat box, um, there's also uh, people have been posting links to uh, some, I guess, historic photographs and whatnot. Uh, so thank you again, everybody for tuning in uh, and come back next week and hope you have a good rest of your Friday. All right, Nathan is the uh, Zoom captain, Nathan with a uh, uh, Baltimore Architecture Foundation. So Nathan, I'll leave it up to you when you want to uh, pull the plug here. Yeah, yeah, I'll give, I'll just give it another 10 seconds or so. But yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And we'll be back next week with the presentation with the Pride of Baltimore 2. Registration is not up yet, but we should have registration up um, by earlier of next week. Thanks.